just uh, for everybody who's here, yes, we're recording, but only for assessment purposes. Uh, participants, I would like to ask you all to mute yourselves during the talk. Um, if, uh, if you are asking a question, then of course you can ask a question, but we're going to leave the questions until question time. You are more than welcome to ask questions during the chat, and uh, I, uh, I may ask them on your behalf if you wish. But uh, otherwise, please uh, respect the, uh, the, uh, the speaker's uh, ability to talk during the, uh, the allotted time. Um, speaking of which, uh, the uh, maximum allowable time for you speakers is 30 minutes. So I'm going to give you a warning at 27 minutes. And then if you uh, carry on past 30 minutes, I will jump in with a big uh, klaxon awuga warning sound and, uh, and cut you down. All right, great. Not as scary as it sounds. Um, after the uh, uh, speaker has concluded, we will have at least five minutes for questions, and then there should be an additional buffer for uh, popping over for the next speaker. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask, but uh, otherwise, we'll get going. Awesome. No question. Awesome indeed. So, first speaker of the day is Liam Carroll. Liam Carroll has been doing a project with Dan Murphy and Thomas Queller, and he's going to tell us about phase transitions in neural networks. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much, David, and thank you everyone for hopping on at 9am. I'm very grateful. Deep learning artificial intelligence is proving to be quite a revolutionary technology, and yet there is currently no widely accepted theory within the deep learning community that explains why it is working quite as well as it is. 15 years ago, Sumio Watanabe showed that deep learning models are actually singular models. And this is a feature, not a bug. And yet his theory remains largely underappreciated by the deep learning community. My name is Liam Carroll. And in this talk, I'm going to present a simple neural network model that illustrates the key point of Watanabe's groundbreaking singular learning theory, that not all true parameters are equally good. And this is because of their singularity structure. So some motivation. Deep learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that uh, aims to model human-like tasks, things like computer vision, things like natural language processing or voice recognition or even they might be able to compose music and things like this. So what you're hearing here is a cover of Frank Sinatra written by an artificial intelligence algorithm. Pretty, uh, pretty scary, isn't it? So deep learning is going to have quite a few benefits for society. It's going to give us things like self-driving cars. It's going to rapidly improve cancer detection and it's going to improve things like agricultural technology. And a lot of people are saying that it's pretty much a certainty that it's going to be a key driver of the fourth industrial revolution. It is unreasonably effective. And the reason for this is the number of parameters in deep learning models vastly exceeds the number of training data that it has. So classically, we would expect these models to overfit the data that they are learning from. And yet, large neural networks actually achieve a very low generalization error. So we can see here, we expect it to be a very bad generalization error for large numbers of parameters. But in reality, it is decreasing with parameters, which is amazing. Deep learning needs a theory. As I said at the start, there's currently no general theory, but science has a long history of theory underpinning technological development. For example, thermodynamic theory um, leading to describing the steam engine, which led to the industrial revolution of the 1800s. Deep learning is in a pretty similar position right now. Without the theory, we can't really hope to fully harness the potential of these deep learning models. And at the moment, it's all really just a matter of trial and error. And only the big companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook are actually able to perform experiments on these huge models because of the comput computational costs involved. 
So in this talk, I'm gonna tell you how singular learning theory is a starting point. So a few fundamental objects. In this talk, we're gonna consider a very simple class of neural networks called two-layer feedforward ReLU neural networks. Such a network is a function that has two inputs, one hidden layer of nodes, which you can see over here, and one output. So typically one thinks of a neural network as uh, a graph that describes connectivity of layers. Deep neural networks have many more hidden layers in here, but for this thesis, we are just gonna consider this simple case so that we can analyze it more carefully. The neural networks will have a set of hidden nodes. They are defined by a parameter little w in big w parameter space where such a parameter is comprised of weights and biases, which ultimately give us a function of this form. Now, the key here is that the ReLU function, which we can see over here, is active. Where, well, it's a linear function when the input is positive, but it is zero when the input is negative. So, in turn, this means that these functions are just piecewise affine planes. And we can see this, if we consider this example with weight vectors given by one, zero, zero, one, negative one, zero, and zero, negative one. If you run that through, you can see how that translates there. This gives us a piecewise affine function with lines as the activation boundaries. So these activation boundaries are where the input is equal to zero. And we can see here, x1 minus one corresponds to this activation boundary, et cetera. So our view of statistical learning is within the Bayesian framework. And the task is to predict a y value for a given input x. We assume that the model is a regression model on the neural network function, which is a standard assumption to make and makes the maths quite tractable. We can only interact with the true distribution via sampling data, uh, sampling samples <laughs> from that true distribution. Those samples are DN. And when we have those samples, what we are interested in is a quantity called the negative log likelihood, which is equal to the mean squared error of the true outputs minus what the uh, neural network is predicting the output to be. So with these objects, we are able to define the posterior distribution of the weights given the data of our underlying true distribution. So the starting point of supervised learning is to measure the loss of a model compared to the truth. And this is called the kullback leblatt divergence from the model to the truth, quite a standard formula in information theory. And this is a loss metric because it is always positive. That's something you can show. And it is zero if and only if the model is equal to the truth. This leads us to define the set of true parameters, which is where the kullback leblatt divergence is minimized. In other words, where the model is equal to the truth. And when W0 is not empty, we say that the truth is realizable by the model. Now, even though this formula may look a bit strange, in actual fact, if the truth is realizable, then it is the kullback leblatt divergence is just the uh, Euclidean distance between the model and the true network weighted by the distribution of the inputs. So one of Watanabe's key insights is that the geometry of this callback level divergence is of fundamental importance to the statistical learning procedure. This brings us to his singular learning theory. So a model, a statistical model is singular if its Fisher information matrix is degenerate for some parameter in parameter space, and it is regular otherwise. So 
the key difference between these models is that in singular models, the true parameters, oh, sorry, let me go back a step. At true parameters, the Fisher information is just equal to the Hessian of the coolback lever divergence. And this implies that true parameters, true parameters of singular models are singularities in the algebraic geometry sense. And this is why Watanabe says that algebraic geometry lies at the heart of statistical learning. In regular models, one of the main results of Bayesian statistics is the Bernstein von Moses theorem, which says that the posterior approaches a normal distribution as the number of samples goes to infinity. But this fails in singular models because clearly the Fisher information matrix is non-invertible because it is degenerate. So to give you an idea of what these what this distinction really means, let's consider a regular <clears throat> and a singular pullback Leibler divergence. So in the regular case, W0, the set of true parameters is just a point or a set of isolated points. But in the singular case, the set of true parameters is a curve or a set of curves. This then means that if we look at the posterior of these functions, the regular, as I said before, just looks like a normal distribution, but a singular model looks completely different to a normal distribution. And so we can see here that uh, we're going to need fundamentally different tools to analyze the posterior of the singular uh, or sorry, to analyze the singular posterior compared to when we would want to analyze the regular posteriors. So this leads us to define something called the free energy. Given a compact subset of parameter space, so we can imagine it as being a small region in the space of parameters, we define the free energy of that subset by this formula here, which is simply the posterior density over integrated over the region in parameter space that we're interested in. So this gives us a measure of posterior concentration of the subset that we're interested in. The reason for the negative log is because it is adjusted to be an effective Hamiltonian, bringing it in line with statistical physics. And it can be shown that the free energy is related to the generalization loss um, of the Bayesian predictive distribution. So for the rest of the talk, you should have in your head that finding these small subsets of parameter space that minimize the free energy is the fundamental statistical learning goal that we are interested in because models from these regions are the best. So, this brings us to the main theorem of singular learning theory. Model complexity is measured by the real log canonical threshold lambda, and lambda is a positive rational number. So I'm not really going to go into the RLCT too much, other than to say that it arises as the pole of an analytically continued zeta function of the coolback leibler divergence. The main theorem is this, in singular models, as the number of training samples approaches infin infinity, the free energy of any given subset W asymptotically satisfies this relation here. And so we see that the RLCT plays a key, ro key role in this asymptotic relation. And the proof of this is about 300 pages in Watanabe's uh, Algebraic Geometry and Stati Statistical Learning book. But the key idea is that he uses Hironaka's resolution of singularities, one of the main theorems of algebraic geometry, to desingularize the coolback leibler divergence. So the upshot here is the RLCT is, or two times the RLCT is the effective number of parameters near the most singular point of the subset that we are considering. So in some cases, this is precisely equal to the rank of the Hessian, 
but in other cases, it may be even less than the rank of the Hessian. In regular models, the RLCT is equal to the total number of parameters divided by two. But in singular models, the RLCT is in general less than the total number of parameters divided by two. Finally, the more singular a point is, the more or the smaller the RLCT is in turn. So to give you some intuition for why a more singular point may be more preferred by the posterior, let's have a look at this example here. So if we consider this callback label divergence over some fixed order parameter, sorry, not fixed, but an order parameter theta, which is not one of the parameters of the model, but just changes the true distribution, we see that at the origin here, this singularity is quite different to those elsewhere. And it is in some sense, a more complicated singularity. And if you observe the posterior as theta approaches zero, you can see that this more singular point appears to have more posterior density. So this is why the geometry of K of W matters immensely. So all of this can be interpreted within Occam's razor. And this is quite a, a fun um, way of looking at it, I think. So we can look at our asymptotic relation as consisting of the accuracy, which is the, oops, which is the uh, minimum attainable loss by any parameter in the set of parameters and the complexity as measured by the RLCT lambda. Now, if we have two different compact subsets that both contain true parameters, if the RLCT of W is less than that of V, which is to say models from this, re models from this region have uh, lesser effective parameters as measured by the RLCT, then the free energy formula suggests that W will have a lower free energy, which means that W is preferred by the posterior. So this says that, well, it's a mathematical realization of Occam's razor. Plurality should not be posited without necessity. Also known as the simplest explanation is usually the right one. And viewing it in this way, Watanabe says that singular models are better able to infer hidden structure from random phenomena. And this is because the model complexity is measured by the RLCT, not just the number of parameters in the model. So we are now going to try to analyze how the posterior prefers different singularities in uh, the space of true parameters. So to this end, we now want to have a look at what are the different singularities on the space of true parameters. So we will classify W0 in the realizable case, where we assume that the truth is given by a two-layer feedforward rally network with M hidden nodes, and the model is given by a similar rally network, but with D hidden nodes. And if we assume this, then classifying W0 is equivalent to classifying functional equivalents of these ReLU networks. The key insight here is that they have to be non-differentiable at the same points. So the activation boundaries have to be the same for both functions. So these activation boundaries have to be the same for any two functions. And what we see here is that this is already giving us a hint, right? We've got, uh, or we can permute the nodes and we can scale them in particular ways and retain the same functional output. So the activation boundaries have to be the same. So in the case where the model and the truth have the same number of nodes, there are three kinds of symmetry, permutation symmetry, scaling symmetry, so 
each weight vector in the model is a scalar multiple of one in the uh, true, true distribution and orientation reversing symmetry. So we can flip the weights. If you've got a WI that can be reversed only if it satisfies, um, oh, only if a collection of them satisfy the, uh, well, only if a collection of them cancel out and give this formula here. So we remark here that it is the scaling symmetry that is used to prove that neural networks are singular in general, or these neural networks are singular in general, because this shows that the Fisher information matrix is degenerate. In the case where the model has more parameters in it than the truth, there is a key uh, type of symmetry that pops up, which is degenerate node symmetries. So we call a node degenerate if the weight vector or one of, or its uh, outer weight QI is equal to zero. So as you can see, that will just mean that it has no meaningful contribution to the function. In the case where D is greater than M, we have the same symmetries as before for M of the nodes, but then for each excess node, it is either degenerate or it has the same activation boundary as one of the other nodes in M. And this, if you carry this through and perform the bookkeeping, you see that you get similar scaling permutation and orientation reversing symmetries. And you've just got to make sure that the gradients and the biases are still equal and just bookkeep correctly. So with this in mind, we now turn our attention to examining which of these points the posterior prefers. So given the terminology that we've used up until now, it should not be surprising to hear that this, uh, that the statistical learning framework can be thought of in a statistical physics way as a Gibbs ensemble. And this brings in uh, the notion of phases and phase transitions, which are quite, quite natural to that study. So here we're gonna simplify the situation just for this page and assume that the free energy just depends on a single parameter V, which defines level sets as defined by some projection of parameter space. So V might be equal to uh, the norm of a parameter, that kind of thing. A phase is a continuous path in the set of critical points that are minimum, that are minima. In other words, a phase is a minimum of the free energy that remains a minimum with small perturbations in some order parameter theta that defines the true distribution. A phase transition then is a change in the configuration of the phases of the free energy. So a first order phase transition is where two minima exchange local and global behavior. A second order phase transition might be a merging of two minima. And another kind of second order phase transition would be where a minimum is created or destroyed. These phases correspond to singularities. So if we recall our relation with the accuracy and complexity of the free energy, we see that a minimum of the free energy will correspond to some region W that has a good accuracy, so a low loss and a low complexity. Thus, these provide different candidate models. So for these experiments, I want you to have in your head that regions of posterior concentration correspond to minima of the free energy. Phases of the free energy correspond to regions that contain a singularity of interest. And first order phase transitions correspond to a change in which region is preferred by the posterior. So with our experiments, we consider the standard setup, but with two hidden nodes, so keeping it very simple, and I'll explain what the true distribution is in a second. We sample uh, parameters from the posterior at a particular inverse temperature as given by Watt and others work. And we use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to do this, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo in particular. Uh, and we change 
the theta value as we go through, which changes the underlying true distribution. For each theta, we performed eight trials that had 20,000 samples in each. And this took about two weeks total compute time to actually get these results. So uh, there was quite a lot of effort in making sure that it would output something sensible and fine tuning it to present something good. Uh, and then the posterior that you will see is averaged over validated trials that just use some standard statistical outlier stuff. Now, since the scaling and permutation symmetries are generic, we are going to quotient them out. So given a sample from the posterior, we are going to define the effective parameter to be the weight times the uh, magnitude of the gradient Q. So all this does is instead of analyzing the raw WI samples, what we're really interested in is what is the actual gradient of one of these ReLU nodes. And so you can see here what that effect does when we scale it. And also because of the permutation symmetry, we superimpose each node, uh, sorry, each weight vector, WI and W2 onto the same plot. And in this plot, you can see that they are just colored by um, their index. Uh, so for each sample, each sample is represented on the plot twice. Now, we are going to consider a true network where the weights fold in towards one another. So they rotate in like this. And the key point is, or the key question I should say, is at theta equals pi on two, which configuration does the posterior prefer? Does it prefer having one node degenerate and one node just be zero two? Or does it prefer both nodes being active and both of them being zero one and zero one? So this is what we're gonna be interested in. These are the two singularities that we're interested in. So let's have a look at how the posterior changes with theta. So uh, you can see here on the W plane, this annulus corresponds to the two phases that we are going to be interested in. And you will see in a second why this makes sense. So at the start here, we can see that only the phase in the non-degenerate region is preferred, which makes sense because theta is low. And as we increase, theta, we see that the phases are moving towards one another. So notice that the red dots are moving towards one another. And right about here, we start to see a little bit of posterior concentration in the degenerate phase. And it's a little bit annoying on this plot, but if you look very closely, you can see on this right hand plot, which shows the uh, relative density of the two phases, um, you can see that it has just emerged as a very tiny amount of density over here. Now, last 27 minutes, Liam. Cool, thank you. As we continue to deform theta or to bring theta to pi on two, we see that the degenerate phase picks up more and more posterior concentration. And then right about here, the two phases are precisely equal to one another as, as measured in this plot. Uh, and then as we continue on, we see that the degenerate region, which is the one up here, like that, it has much more posterior concentration and therefore is becoming a deeper minima of the free energy. And yet at this point, that configuration is not actually on the set of true parameters. So this is quite a, a remarkable um, result. Now, let me get rid of the scribbles. As we continue further, we see that this behavior just sets in. And the final point is that at theta equals pi on two, both phases are true parameters. We have both of these possible configurations, but we see that the degenerate phase is much more preferred by the posterior than the non-degenerate phase. 
And if you run this through in your head, you might think, well, that may make sense within the framework of singular learning theory because here we only have one model parameter effectively. And so the singularity structure, we may expect to be more singular for this point. Thereby we infer that this uh, configuration, this phase may have a lower RLCT. So it turns out that this first order phase transition corresponds to uh, or sort of loosely corresponds to where the accuracy of the two phases accuracy becomes comparable so if we see here that point is roughly about there on this accuracy plot and we can see that around about here they start to become comparable and that's when the lower model complexity of uh, the degenerate phase comes into play. So key fact one, in singular models, true parameters are preferred according to their RLCT. And key fact two, non-true parameters can still be preferred by the posterior. So in Leave summary, 30 minutes now. Cool. Deep learning is singular and that is very good artificial intelligence is going to be possible because of these singularities. Thank you to my supervisors, Daniel Murphy and Thomas Queller, and thank you all for listening. Excellent wrap up, appreciate that. Thank you. I look forward for everybody. I'm the most important person. Um, let's uh, open to questions, please. You can uh, unmute yourselves and ask questions, that's great. Seems we have a very shy and possibly sleepy audience today. <laughs> so I'll kick off. Um, I, uh, I don't know very much about deep learning at all. Um, so a very naive newbie question, which possibly you um, already mentioned, the, uh, the models that you're using here, are these linear models or nonlinear models? The ReLU function is nonlinear. So mm -hmm. it's it's linear when it is activated, and that is why it is a piecewise affine function, but it is non-linear, and in fact, it's non-analytic because of the fact that it, it has that. Um, you have some phase transitions, obviously. But, uh, yeah. All right, so with uh, your, you're trying to understand this model, you're trying to identify parameters in this model, is that? Uh, yeah, you're so training it based on some sort of data is that yes. correct understanding? Yep. And so, so are well, you sorry. assuming that your data is uh, is uh, one hundred percent accurate, or are you uh, allowing for the fact that it's probably noisy? No. So the data is noisy, and we allow for that fact as well in the model. So right. that's the uh, the regression model, which basically says that we think that it is a neural network underlying it. But to account for some of the noise, we make it a regression model and just add that, um, okay. that standard variance. And so you in have some sort of uh, entropic measure for how to uh, how to come up with the uh, you know the sort of the best fit or the best number of parameters to describe the noisy data that you see. Is that uh... well? I guess the um, I guess the posterior is really. Uh, sort of taking that into account in some yeah. sense. It sort of combines all of the different elements at play and produces a distribution of what which parameters it thinks most likely the model, sorry, which parameters are most likely underlying the true distribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, as I say, I know almost nothing about this, but uh, in dynamical systems theory, there's uh, uh, people who uh, who study parameter fitting to models, but there the number of parameters is also a parameter. And so right. they, uh, they use sort of entropy as what they call minimum dis description length as a way yep. of uh, deciding how many parameters they should actually use and how many is just fitting the noise. And in, in a lot of normal statistics, you know, if you just consider a standard linear regression, that sort of is the how a statistician goes about it, right? It's like, well, you try a linear fit first and then you go, oh, okay, that doesn't look so right. Maybe a quadratic fit, 
etc. Whereas singular models are more easily able to actually decide that complexity for themselves. That's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. I'll shut up now. Somebody else needs to ask a question. <laughs> Thanks, Gabriel Leanne. has uh, something in chat. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself, Gabriel? Uh, sure. Um, so yeah, so 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 just the, the premise at the start uh, was that you know experiments uh, are very computationally expensive, um, and it looked like even with singular learning theory, uh, experiments are, are very computationally expensive. Um, so I'm just wondering. Um, so, sort of if you if you think there's a kind of direction things are going to go away or, or maybe you only need these simple results to then to then infer uh results about more complex models um or yeah if you could if you could comment on that hopefully that yeah yeah, yeah yeah no it's a it's a great question so the usual framework of deep learning is a frequentist framework and it is uh, models are trained using stochastic gradient descent with back propagation. And the reason for this is because that is computationally way better <laughs> than using Markov chain Monte Carlo to do this. So you correctly noted how much more difficult Markov chain Monte Carlo is. So at this point, singular learning theory appears to describe what is happening in these deep neural networks but it is, it's quite a young theory in a lot of ways. And as I say, the deep learning community hasn't really um, grabbed onto it yet. And so in a lot of ways, the actual point of this research is to try and bring this singular learning theory to the deep learning community and say to them, look at this, this looks like a fruitful direction to understand what is happening. Can you apply some of your mental power and some of your computational power to start to try and uncover some of these things more properly? So you certainly could not do any of this Markov chain stuff for any sort of real world uh, modern neural network at the moment. But hopefully by analyzing these simpler ones, we can start to understand some of the intricacies at play and also present, well, you know, <laughs> some fun animations that can really try and illustrate what's actually happening and what the theory is talking about. Because the theory itself is quite dense and uses some pretty heavy algebraic geometry machinery to prove a lot of the results. Fantastic, thanks very much. No worries, thanks for the great question. So I think we have time for one more very quick question if anybody wants to volunteer. I have a, um, I have a question actually. Um, Go for it, Oscar. The, the analogy between the free energy and uh, what well, minimizing the free energy and finding true parameters was pretty interesting. I was just wondering if there was any literature um, in your own group or Watanabe relating uh, other macroscopic variables of um, statistical physics to this deep learning, like entropy or derivatives of the free energy that uh, could provide you with any insight? Yeah, good question. So you can set up the analogy between the Gibbs ensemble and the statistical learning machine, the model. Um, and you can sort of write it all down and look at the different objects and try and pick out which ones correspond to which. And then from that, you might hope to write down something like the expected value of the Hamiltonian or the expected value of the entropy. And at the moment, um, in some of Dan's work, he's sort of written these things down and, and tried to look at them. It's not necessarily clear to us which of these quantities are actually going to be interesting or are actually of interest. Um, but you can certainly write them down using this correspondence and hopefully we can start to get our heads around which of these kinds of quantities are actually of interest and how they relate to things like the generalization error and uh, the RLCT and that kind of thing. Awesome, thanks. Thanks right, for I the think, question. Uh, we're gonna have to wrap up there, I'm afraid. Time is uh, running away as always. Thanks uh, Liam again for a really nice talk.